Hello and welcome to a DM's Guide to the Tomb Annihilation. We are currently on episode 17 and today we're going to look at the murky depths of level 5. We're going to discuss the Ableth. If you enjoy this content, like and subscribe. And if you're feeling generous, we've got a Patreon link in the description below. Let's begin. So we're going to start off with 64, base of the waterfall. The walls of this grotto are slick with slime and they are reeks of decay. Filthy water tumbles down from a hole in the ceiling, then courses along a rough hue tunnel towards a murky lake. The din of machinery echoes from that direction. All this is is entryway to level 1. If your characters, instead of going down the stairway and they make their way to area 17 on level 1, they will fall down and they will land in the base of this waterfall. To climb the slimy walls back up to level 1 requires a successful DC 15 strength letter check. The water here is 30 feet deep and if your characters don't do anything, they will gently flow into 65 the underground lake. If your character is a lad here, they're going to flow in and going to make her way to 65. 65, the underground lake. A dark underground lake opens up before you. Its ceilings fastened with chains and gears, some of which appear to have dwarfs dangling from them. A gigantic, motionless stone cog rises from the water, with two matching cogs connected to it. Rusty metal conduits stretch from the cavern walls to the cogs. The water of the lake is slimy with pinpricks of phosphorant light twinkling in the murk. So let's say your characters come from here or they simply jump out the gears as we mentioned in the previous episode. They'll see this. They'll see undead dwarf rites are currently doing maintenance. They are not going to do anything to your characters unless they get attacked. If they do get attacked, they're going to use their crossbows. So just to give you a quick understanding, so this lake is 20 feet deep and from the lake to the roof is another 20 feet. You also have this Abolith. So this Abolith has two personalities, which is really important. The main question is, what is an Abolith and why would a Serac have an Abolith in his tomb? So let's look at Abolith then. So this is an Abolith. You can see that it has got a large armor class of 17. It has 135 hit points. It's slow in land, but fast in the water. It has low dex, high strength, and it has telepathy. And the main thing about this telepathy is if a creature communicates telepathically with Abolith, the Abolith learns the creature's greatest desires if the Abolith can see the creature. That's very, very important. So let's say that your characters communicate telepathically through this command panel here. Since Ambleth can't see the characters, it won't be able to tell its truest, deepest desires. So a brief description of Ablis is Ablis before the coming of the gods, Ablis lurked in the primordial oceans and underground lakes. They reached out with their minds and seized control. Their dominance made them like gods and the true gods appeared in smashing the Ablis empire and freeing their slaves. Ablis have never forgotten. So the main thing is Ablis will never forget. Ablis have flawless memories. They pass on their knowledge and experience from generation to generation. Because of their memories, the Ablis minds are like treasure troves. These Ablis know everything from the beginning of time till now. My realisation is that a Seric might be a lich, he might know everything about necromancy, however he doesn't know everything. I believe that a Seric has captured this Ablith solely for knowledge and so he can learn different methods of building this tomb and learn information in the multiverse. Garla Rue. He lives in the lake and when Aserak enslaved it, the Ablith lost its mind and developed a split personality. Its dominant aspect awaits the dooming of the Death God, which is believed heralds the fall of divinity. And because Ablith were defeated by the gods, he doesn't like them very much. Until that day, Ablith humbly obeys Wellers, who he knows as Gore, his real name, and attacks anyone seeking to prevent the Atrophiles. Ascension. Dablo's other personality is that of a humanoid child. Helpless, gleeful, insanely curious. In this state of mind, Dablo poses no threat to anyone and flees of attacked. To so determine this, you roll a dice. If it's even, Ablo's child personality is dominant. If it's odd, it's his true personality is dominant. So let's come back to the previous episode with the command panel. Your characters can telepathically chat to this Ablo. If your characters turn the red dial, they establish a telepathic link, as I explained before, with Ablo's. And depending on what dice you roll, so it's completely up to yourself, you can roll a dice every sentence or you can roll a dice every few minutes when your characters are speaking with a Zabloth. So I'm going to talk about roleplay Zabloth here. Because one thing I find is some people love doing voice acting, some people not so. Just out of curiosity, in the comments below, let me know if you like voice acting your characters as a DM or do you simply 
call it out like a script. From my experience with role playing as Abolith, is very, very difficult. If your characters talk to a voice they've never heard before in their minds, when playing with this control panel, since they've got so much information going on, it's quite hard for them to figure out what this voice is. Is it weathers? Is it something? And especially when you added the aspects of the split personality, and if you're not too good at role playing, such as I, it's quite difficult for your characters to realize they're talking to one character or multiple characters. To overcome these difficulties with role playing Nabolith, what I'll do is explain to my characters that you noticed a shift in its voice. And then perhaps you can get them to make an insight check. They can hear Nabolith's voice and they can determine that perhaps he does have a split personality or there's something going on with his mind. So if your characters come from the top and touch this control panel, in reality, they might talk to Nabolith for a couple of moments. So the main thing to realise is that since Zabalith is a treasure of knowledge, they can ask Zabalith any question and it probably know the answer. So let's say that your characters meet the childish Zabalith. The way I'd run it is that if they asked him a question, he would answer wholeheartedly. But he will definitely ask your questions something out of curiosity. And since Zabalith knows everything, I would ask questions that are very... They're impossible for a normal person to know, such as questions like this. How many stars are there in the sky? Or how many litres of water is in the ocean? Because Abolith, since it has a photographic and a perfect memory, would know such facts, and it might have been down in this tomb for a hundred, maybe 150 years. And yeah, and remember that the Abolith in this state is a child, so if your character's insulted in any way, it might run off and just go in a huff. If it is being serious, it might try to manipulate your characters in such a way that it lures them into the water. So let's keep on discussing what happens in the water and how you might meet this Abolith and what he'll do if you come in contact with him. So if your characters arrive here, they'll see 66 Door of Devouring. A work stone column stretches from the bottom of the lake to the cavern roof and is attached to the nearby wall by a stone conduit. On one side of the column, steps of moss-covered stone climb from a stone dock to a landing those stone doors shows no handles or hinges. Ropes lash a pair of rowboats to a dock post, and a rusty iron cage wallows in the slime. Held aloft by a chain winch, phosphorant crabs gather at the bottom of the lake, below the cage. So if your characters see this, they know there's two rowboats. Each rowboat has a name. One's called Predator, one's called Prey. If your character's aboard Predator, they have advantage on attack rolls as well in the boat while it's in water. This is recognised by a filled bullseye lantern hanging off the boat's bow. Creatures aboard the Prey have advantage on saving throws while the boat is in the water. If you look on D&D Beyond, you can see that rowboats, they can go 15 feet a turn water. They require an action for you to row it. So one character has to row it, and it'll have a total of, the hull will have a total of 50 hit points, and the oars will have a total of 25 hit points. When your characters walk up these steps, they'll see a door. When your characters climb the mossy staircase, they climb up out the lake, and they notice that the landing's covered with crab shell. A monstrous mouth forms on the door's surface, calling out with a deep drawl, I'm so hungry, I could eat you alive, but I'll sell for something else, something living, something light. And this door is similar to a magic mouth spell. A successful dispel magic DC 19 cast on the door suppresses the magic for 10 minutes. If you suppress this mouth, you won't be able to get through the door. The mouth can only say this phrase. If the mouse is offered a live phosphorescent crab, it opens wide, chomps down to consume the crab, and spits out the shells. However, if the mouse offered something else, isn't a crab, and a character is within 10 feet of it, it will engulf a character with no saving throw. And this character is teleported to Area 57, which we've discussed in an earlier episode. So if your characters want to gain this entrance, if they go past this door, they'll go up and you can see weathers and they can see the hidden compartments in here. But however, to open the door, they need crabs. So the way they can get crabs is by going down this cage and collecting crabs from the sea floor. And this is when they'll meet the Aboleth. A rusty iron gate on the side of the cage provides space for two medium or smaller creatures. Cage radiates transmutation magic to detect magic spell or a similar effect. This bestows the effect or a breathing spell to any creatures within it. The stout bars grant half cover against attacks originating from outside the cage. Another character using a winch on the steps can lower the cage 20 feet to the lake bed, allowing the characters in the cage to easily harvest 2d6 phosphorescent crabs from the muck. 
However, as I said before, the creaking the center of the cage draws the attention of the Ampliff. So you have two choices, as in if it's being dominant, it's going to attempt to enslave any of the characters within the cage. And if that succeeds, he's going to send up other player characters to lure more characters down into the depths. And if you're lucky and the Ampliff is childlike, it swims over and it starts up a conversation using its telepathy. In combat, the Ableth can do a couple of abilities. So the main ability it will do is it will try to enslave. It will enslave up to three times a day. The Ableth targets one creature it can see within 30 feet of it. This is the reason why it can't enslave people who are in the control room. The target will succeed in a DC 14 wisdom saving throw or be magically charmed by the Ableth. So a DC 14 wisdom saving throw is quite low. However, if your character is charmed, it's under the Ableth's control and can't take your actions and the Ableth and the target can communicate telepathically with each other over any distance. Whenever the charm target takes damage, the target can repeat the saving throw and a success, the effect ends. No more than once, every 24 hours the target can also repeat the saving throw when it's at least one mile away from the Ableth. Potentially with these rules, the Ableth could charm a character and get him to leave the tomb and cause havoc. However, since he's been subdued by Serac, he won't do that. He's simply going to lure the player characters into the depths below. And what happens if your characters succeed and they don't get enslaved, what's he going to do? So he has a multi-attack, so he's going to make three tentacle attacks. So the tentacle is a plus nine to hit, it has a 10 foot reach, and if it hits, it does 2d6 plus five bludgeoning damage. And if the target is a creature, it must succeed in the DC 14 constitution saving throw. And this is when things get really nasty. If it gets hit, it becomes diseased. The disease has no effect for one minute and can be removed by any magic that cures disease. However, after one minute, the diseased creature's skin becomes translucent and slimy. The creature can't regain hit points unless it's underwater. The disease can be removed only by heal or other disease curing spell of sex level or higher. When the creature is outside a body of water, it takes 1d12 acid damage every 10 minutes unless moisture is applied to the skin before 10 minutes have passed. So it's a very, very nasty ability. Hopefully your party has magic users that can subdue this effect. So to get a level 6 spell, you will need a cleric or an Arcus Fimilar caster of at least 11th level to do this. So hopefully none of your clerics in the party are multi-classed. Oaks has legendary actions. So it can do take two of its legendary actions to do Psychic Drain. One creature charmed by Labyrinth takes 3d6 Psychic Damage and Labyrinth regains hit points equal to the damage the creature takes. And it can do Tail Swipe, so it makes one tail attack. The tail attack is a plus nine to hit, 10 foot reach, and it does 3d6 plus five bludgeoning damage. And final one is Detect, and it can make a perception check just in case any of your rogues have saved the stealth. And its final ability, so it can do mucus cloud. So while underwater, the Ableth is surrounded by transformative mucus. A creature that touches Ableth or hits it with a melee attack within 5 feet of it must make a DC 14 costume saving throw. On a failure, the creature is diseased for 1d4 hours. The diseased creature can only breathe underwater, so it traps the creatures with it. And it has no resistances, however it does have a plus 12 to history and a plus 10 to perception. So it'll be a very interesting fight, and luckily for my players, when they met the Ableth in the control room, they insulted its child form and it ran away, and that was the last they seen this Ableth. But let me know in your campaign, did your player characters get killed by Ableth? How did you roleplay it? Was it a fun encounter for you? Please let me know in the comments below. And if you want to make this encounter easier for yourself because it's quite frustrating, I would simply just choose Avalith to have its childish personality. Because it allows a little bit of fun in the game and your characters will be really confused when they see a giant tentacled monster talking like a child swimming back and forth in the middle of this tomb. Well, the next episode we're going to go to 62 and that's the Stone Juggernaut. And we'll finish that episode with 67, the Hall of the Gold Macedon. And just a quick update announcement, what's going to happen is we're going to upload the first 10 episodes of the DM's Guide that was on the QNKO 9S channel, it's going to be uploaded onto this channel. So don't worry when you see your subscription feed below with 10 new episodes. And again, if you enjoy the content, like and subscribe, and if you're feeling generous, page the link below, and I hope to see you in the next one. Ciao.